this has started the 16 industrial regional industrial revolution it's supposed to bring back the 15 dormant regions that we have left for so long and we haven't done anything but tonight i would like to unveil all the potential minerals arable lands and all that we have discovered through the research within the 15 regions to Ghanaians. Now, as you are saying, we start by making sure we invest in all these 16 regions. That is industrial plants to be able to refine all our minerals and then the processing plants to be able to process all our agro plants. So I would be able to take my time and take you through our research on attribution reserves shows that gold, iron ore, gas, bauxite, and lithium and diamond, potential of agro processing and all the arable lands in the country amounts to 2.5 trillion US dollars. This is the outcome of our research. We are determined to bring out every region's wealth. So as you can see, I mean, we have searched every region inside out and realized what sort of wealth that can be created there and projected it in the next 10 years, Ghana will have an economic output at 4.7 trillion with the 13 million hectares of arable lands and all these minerals. We will also create 8 million jobs in a decade. Now, let me look at some of the places. I've already showed you Volta region. Maybe we should look at Ashanti region. Can we? Maybe we could see another region. So, as you already seen, Ashanti is 240 billion worth of gold minerals lithium and arable spaces for us to create the biggest potential of farming agro processing we want to become exporters not importers i mean let's look at western region you just saw western region it's one of my favorite regions i believe that this region is going to become the texas of africa this is where we are going to have the most industrial plants with the most minerals the most agro uh, a products to be processed and is right next to the coast. We can supply Africa and even supply the world. We have to take the Western region very serious. 420 something billion, it's something for us to take very serious because one is going to create all the jobs in the Western side and even bring people from other parts of Ghana. We are going into wealth creation. And I want to do this with you, Ghana. As you can see, wealth creation comes with job creation. But we produce 200,000 barrels of oil per day in Ghana. We sell this and then, in fact, we let people extract it, go and refine it. Then we go back to Europe and buy this same product, premium, and sell our fuel at 50 point something cities per liter all we have to do is build our refineries and we will have competitive prices and we will save the losses in the economy the inflation in the economy just because of industrialization as we can see also just our oil can also produce us all the petrochemicals we don't need to import products we need to export products the more we import products the more we drive our economy out of this country. The more we export products, the more we take in other people's economy into our country. And the more we would export, it means we have created jobs. You know, this is going to make Ghana become the powerhouse of Africa. Okay? We cannot do a Greek without the culture. Now, you can see that we have a lot of farmers in Ghana, but we don't have the processing plant to process the farming products. So we do that Greek, but we don't do the culture. The culture is the seven times of processing 
one product like cocoa it can be chocolate it can be cocoa butter cream it can be a shampoo it can be so many things and there is the brown fills to create other things from this one product and create more jobs as you can already see 800,000 jobs per year within the 16 regions that makes it at least 50,000 people getting a job in a region I mean I'm being conservative with the 8 million jobs in 10 years but to be honest with you a machine a plant is the only thing that can give you jobs in three different shift eight hours times three a day that is what I call 24 hour economy you need industrialization who sells Gary for 24 hours in Makola the women in Kejetia and Kantamanto cannot work for 24 hours it would take a factory it would take a plant a production line to give three shifts a day no industrialization no 24-hour economy I have brought you your economic of freedom with all this potential how do we connect our regions and transport the supplies on the industrial scale that takes you to pillar two we've just finishing with pillar one I can hear you well we have just finished with pillar one and I would like to introduce you to pillar two I want a nation to give me this moment and pay me this attention because this is truly a vision a policy a developmental agenda and with or without me it must be applied so let's go to pillar two pillar two is the water transportation and interregional railway connectivity this is Ghana's first water transportation now as you can see in the olden days our fathers really had respect for these natural resources that we came to meet but today we don't have value for it anymore we have to remember everything that we eat from on this land is grown by the water on this land and there are so many regions that we can connect to by connecting the water so let me tell you my vision about the water connectivity infrastructure now one thing that I can see in this country Lake Volta is the largest man-made lake in the world why are people not visiting Ghana to view Lake Volta in fact what have we done with Lake Volta I mean you have billions of dollars sitting in Lake Volta maybe we'll talk about it later but our national grade of water transport it's something that we should look at when we look at maybe even going here and pointing to some of these things you're seeing here okay and, and I know this brings us to the moment of the sea coming to Kumasi but as you can see this is Cape Coast right here and this is the Gulf of Guinea so I, I can enlarge it for you to see so this is Cape Coast right here this river River Pra and I'm so sorry to mention what has happened to it but we'll get to that River Pra leads all the way to Ofing and goes over there to Anum and goes there to Birim and to Koforidia so here is Kumasi right here <laughs> okay you can see it now what we have to do is something called industrial dredging you can go back and look at countries like Egypt that have used and dredged and had canals that generate 9.4 billion a year the canals are meant for a lot of things and the water transportation are also meant for a lot of things the irrigation of this country for all our plants 
and all our crops we need industrial irrigation so we need to do it one way or the other to support the system the ferries the cruises the leisure the transportation and the logistics that will move all the industrial products that we are about to manufacture will be pulled on this water irrigation and purification and logistics is one of the most important things in this world now i can tell you that ghana imports almost 89 percent to 92 percent of the things in this country how did it get here at least a fraction of 90 percent of that came on the water so we need to make use of our water it's very very important will bring so much for tourism so with the support of us connecting all this water together we are not only going to have an industrial scale to support the agriculture but also we will raise tourism and we will have the biggest distribution channel that connects to the coast and the coast can connect to the world we intend very soon to supply the world with what we're about to industrialize with the 16 industrial revolution now not only that i know i've been talking about waters but i know that's not the only infrastructure that you need for transportation or for logistics the railway network is part of our vision our vision is to develop a comprehensive railway network exceeding 8,000 kilometers that is 1.5 million tons of steel it will be very difficult to import this from outside. That's why we have our eyes on the iron ore in the Industrial Revolution. And some is in the eastern and some are other parts of Ghana. We will be able to manufacture our own steel and create that 8,000 kilometer railway track that will cost us billions of dollars if we had to give it out on contract. And connect and build the eastern corridor, the western corridor. And guess what? The gist of this vision is to also drive the railways to the three borders that faces Ghana. The one in Togo, the one in uh, Burkina Faso, and the one to Ivory Coast. When it gets to the edge, we stop. That is us creating new transportation and logistical path and not remain on the colonial roads that was built for us. Now we're making our own paths to distribute our own goods but when it gets to the border the government of that country is responsible to continue this is going to give us a railway and a speedway around west africa once every country continues from there well i'd like to tell you something it's likely when we get to the border ghanaians will be contracted to continue the railways because guess what we will have the steel we will have the skills just like what the English did to Europe. Once you have the skills, once you have the funds, and once you have the reserves, and you have industrial power, you're in control. And so, this is our plan for Pillar 2. And as you can see, the water connectivity is important and the railway connectivity is coming to that. Now, the moon needs the sun to shine right so does the pillar two it needs pillar three to thrive so let me introduce you to pillar three and that is our developmental policy three energy city and a technology hub energy city and i know most people haven't probably seen this but energy city is built in countries like bahrain qatar many places that's a consolidated energy resources and pipelines and big offices that connects with all mineral resources that produces and that produce energy so our energy city is definitely fit to to add value to our industrial vision to be able to create more megawatts to be able to create more substations when we tap into our gas pipelines, be able to use our gas and our water 
as you can see there is hydroelectric power plants we have to expand there will be wind farms there will be solar farms thermal power plants such as natural gas and biomass power plants our energy sources we need to meet our industrial demands and the demands of our people we need to build pipelines and it's very important I mean when I say pipelines pipelines across the regions to support the energy system and the infrastructure but all of this is great to do Ghana just remember we need even to move with the larger step going forward I want to say this 640 million people in Africa do not have access to energy I don't know if you know this it's more than 50 percent of Africans population well let me use this opportunity to introduce a sub division idea behind this policy or this vision and that is introducing the nuclear power plant in this country we will be one of the main people and one of the best in the world to have taken this idea and implemented the nuclear energy is rare in the world and more so in Africa but we have a chance to establish international relationships we also have the chance to now trade uranium with Niger and Namibia that's connecting already to be able to build this we will position ourselves as the heart of Africa nuclear power plants does not only reduce the cost per kilowatt but it just makes electricity affordable visible accessible and we need this because they have it but we don't and we're struggling more than 50 percent of us we still don't have light in 2024 when we have uranium sitting no energy no technology but technology is a mass Ghana needs a technology hub and that's why we've combined technology hub with the energy city when I say technology hub I don't know if the old school will really understand what I mean but I would have to break it down okay it's a combination of Silicon Valley's and on a whole industrial platform okay to build all technological gadgets that the world demands everybody today is holding an iPhone or they have a laptop or or they have a tap but we don't produce these things in our country we have the minerals already we have lithium we have recycling plastic going into industrialization is going to give us the capacity to be able to build our own mobile phones and our own laptops and we can produce our schools with laptops that would teach them what we want them to learn right from the beginning we are in control of our destiny by producing it ourselves and it's there we just need to make sure that we put these plants and get this energy and produce these products and do this packaging and trade it to the world that is creating jobs creating value and being in control see one would think it's only mobile phones and laptops and electricals that you need when you're building a technology hub no data centers our data centers are very very important so we intend to build more data centers okay to support the technology hub but when they talk about data center a lot of people think data center is just to store information and data no it goes beyond that we want to position ourselves for the crypto farming in the world so what our data centers is going to do is that it's going to start mining digital coin tokenization we will tokenize we will mine digital coins we will mint and i know the young people the youth understand where i'm going with that because they know they're the future this is the future of finance and it's trillions multi-trillions of dollars we need to tap into this industry and have the power for them to create demand from us this is going to make us become the gateway to the multi-trillion dollar web 3 industry in Africa 
this technology hub is going to put us ahead. We envision that Ghana leads the software revolution in Africa and the hardware revolution in Africa. We need data centers, and we do, to even support our artificial intelligence and deep learning. It's obvious that no energy, no technology. That said, without industrialization, there will be no digitization. It is impossible. <laughs> Hashtag, it is impossible. No industrialization, no digitization. Let me take you to pillar four. I know you're with me. And pillar four is one of my favorite pillars. You see, we have been talking about all these great things and all these developments and all this wealth building and all of this job creation. But there's one thing that I learned from our ancestors. You know, when I was learning from how the other people governed this world, the likes of the Egyptians and the King Solomons and the Mansa Musas and all the Americas and Europeans, they took one thing seriously. The Africans are not taking it serious. And that is reserves, reserves, reserves. Even an ant stores food. You need to store things. You need to have reserves. We are a nation of 33 million people. What have we prepared for our future? Where is our oil reserves? Where is our gold reserves? I mean, up until recently, we had only seven tons in our central bank. And this information is public information. Up until recently. I don't know if it's really gotten to 14 now. Because the last time they needed more tons just to borrow money. But that's all. And you have the likes of multinational companies like the Goldfields. And they have moved 300s of tons from this country. And we can only have 7 tons as our reserves. Why is Qatar keeping 500 tons as reserves? Why, is, why does England have 3,000 something just gold reserves? Why? I mean, what is it going to cost us to build our own hard rock mining? To go for the target, I want to take that first 200 tons as reserves in this country. I will do whatever it takes because I already have the gold on the ground. And we, as the new force, as the new generational leaders who are thinking with vision, we would make sure that we create that reserves for gold and fund or money will not be a problem but not only that do you need in reserves not just gold or not just oil some of the biggest things in this world you'll be surprised is the food we eat every day is the basic necessity and if you can have that you have the opportunity and the power to feed the world so we intend to build the biggest seedling bank and have, and have food security for 100 years. It's called agro reserves. That's what we need. We would nurture this. We would actually feed this. And we are going to have food for a good 100 years. Reserves. The farmers will buy from us. If Ivory Coast run out of cocoa, they will buy from us. If India needs food, they will buy from us. This will make us like Joseph. Feeding the seven years of famine. Because we have kept the reserves. There are minerals that we can keep reserves. There is copper. There is iron. There is bauxite. All we have to do is keep extracting Keep creating the jobs with the people and letting them have the chance to be able to bring these things out of the ground and keep it as reserves. Whenever you refine any of this or you plant any of this, the value can be from times 5 to 10 or 15. It quadruples. It triples. 
it multiplies. Well, I've been talking about food. I've been talking about good reserves. I've been talking about food reserves. All these reserves, 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 it's for the state. It's for the nation. This is what I call a Japadier, the real a Japadier. Because you need an equity of what belongs to you. As one, we have to have a share of whatever that is on our grounds. We have to get jobs from it. We have to create wealth out of it. And we have to get the skill set out of what belongs to us. It's on our ground. We are the landlords of Ghana. It should be shared among us equally. But with all the reserves, there's one thing that I would like to add. And I know you, we probably never thought of it. But why do we buy money? Why do we have to go to England or go to Switzerland to Delarue to print our money? And after we, f we fly or ship the money before we have money. What happened to the industrial power that we're creating now? We are going to print money at home. We don't need to go to England or America to print money. We don't need to go anywhere else to go and buy food and bring it here. We don't need to pay seven times the taxes of whatever that is already in our country and someone has just packaged it. We go and buy it for premium price and bring it back here. That stops because we are going to create it here. Now that we have more reserves, 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 and have even cash reserves, what is next? Fellow Ghanaians, I like to say this. Pillar 5, it's from the bottom of my heart. And this, even when we are not here, this should take us through the centuries. This should not make you just remember me. This should make you know that when I'm not here, my absence will be felt. Because I have found a way to take you back to Susu, where you came from. How your ancestors, your older gods, your fathers survived in the 500 BCs. We are going to create the National Sovereign Wealth Fund. This is the new IMF. Well, at this very point, Ghana is going to help me launch the new IMF. Because verbally, it said. But, physically and mentally, we are about to implement it. This pillar is a new policy and it would distract, disrupt, and dissolve but eventually it will rebuild our heritage value in the past our minerals have been extracted and exported for pennies we're ending it the national sovereign wealth fund is the new imf independent and autonomous it will collect every reserves and it will keep it and it will protect it would nobody have to pretend you're not accountable or responsible for our own anymore because now it's secured within the national fund and if anybody needs anything within the ministries or the government let them go to the fund and they will know this fund has more wealth than imf or the world bank can ever give them and they will know it all came from these grounds it's the reserves your gold your cocoa your hundred years of seedling banks your tax reserves. I mean, feed the fund. I mean, 100 million barrels of oil. 100 years of seedling reserves. All of this is going to be in the wealth fund of Ghana. Now, let me tell you the interesting thing about the tax reserves. To increase our reserves, we decided that we're going to minimize the corruption in the tax sector. Because you can see in a box, maybe there is some, um, let me see if I have a tax reserve box here. Something to explain it better. But you can see that we have almost 45% of royalties, of taxes, of many things that we collect. And yet, we don't see that value. What we are saying now is that we simply 
are going to take 30% of all gold extracted, all minerals extracted as income tax, no royalties, nothing. 30% of everything extracted from the multinationals and it goes directly into our reserves. And that's where we quadruple the value. We multiply the value. So our taxes, one, is not going to go missing again. But two, it's going to be in the form of raw material. And three, our industrial platforms will quadruple that. We need the reserves. That determines how rich we are, how wealthy we are in a country. And for me, we have found something good for Ghana. I hope the African countries can take this blueprint as well. And start making sure that they have their own reserve banks. Just like all the first class countries in this world. They have reserves. That being said, I would like to take you to Pillar 6. I think this is my favorite. But I know I have a lot of favorites in these 12 pillars. And these pillars are supposed to be the pillars that hold the structure of this country. We look at this country as a structure before we can protect the roof of this country, before we can protect the floors of this country, the grounds of this country, the foundation of this country. And that's why I believe that the SNITS revolution is going to revolutionize Ghana. Now let's go into this. The SNIT revolution is solving three major needs, but I also call it major problems of Ghanaians. And that's health, education, and accommodation. Currently, contributors of SNIT have to pay and wait up to 40 years to pension before they would be qualified for their claims. Some will die halfway and it will not even be given to their children. Some will never even see this. But we have changed it. As from now, we would say that our policy would be turning the SNIT fund into, turning SNIT into a nation's insurance fund. This insurance fund is interesting, and I'd like to take you through it. Ghanaians will now be eligible to claim for their health, education, and accommodation. How so? Because in the next five years, you can claim your SNIT back. You can claim it in cash or you can invest it in insurance. If you invest it in insurance and then you have one of the major problems or the needs in Ghana, which is either I've lost my job and I don't have somewhere to stay, that your 5,000 or 10,000 savings in SNIT can become times 10 to get you home. An accommodation, somewhere to stay. You can put in the claim. You can put in the claim when you have a major health issue like how you go to hospitals and the people die first because maybe they don't have the cash first this policy is kill me first bill me later you can go to the insurance funds we're not going to let people in the country be homeless and fall out on the street because they have no jobs your SNIT fund is supposed to be able to become the insurer that will get you the home and this is what is going to happen. Once we do all of this, we're going to create a fund. This fund will guarantee payments for investors. So I'm a developer. I will be interested if I know that 100,000 Ghanaians will rent homes from me as long as there is a claim and guarantee payment. So it makes sense for me to put a feasibility study together for whatever investment partners and do that development because it turns around. It's also going to attract, it's going to attract uh, investors in the hospital area. It's going to attract even educational facilities. It will bring all of that together. I know that this next revolution might be set, stepping on some conditions that already exist, but sometimes... We need to change our clothes when they're too old or when it's dirty. We just need to move on. It's another day. And so let's change it and let's move on. Now, Pillar 7. I know I've been saying all of this, but it say if you want to educate uh, a, a, a nation, you educate the woman of that nation. 
and it will transcend it will go down further we believe that education in this country needs to be tweaked changed make it adaptable to our culture and that's why pillar 7 introduces to you industrication it's industrialization with education coming together we coined this well this word by merging industrialization and education why do we continue to use a curricula and a syllabus that are over a century old and why is it talking about europe and america why can't you study about your ground why don't you know about how to dig your gold why does it have to take somebody to come from outside to find where your gold is <laughs> why do you have to give your cocoa to someone before he turns it to chocolate for you <laughs> what happened what happened to you knowing about your sea that you have oil in there and it can create petrol for you we need to educate Ghanaian children about Ghanaian values culture minerals the minerals and how it gets processed and agriculture and the values that can come out of it the power of supply and distribution we need to de-westernize the curriculum and that's exactly what we're doing we need to build an industrial mindset very important industrialize the curriculum tailor education to our industrial needs and out of that we're going to start building entrepreneurs. We're going to start building industrialists. We're going to start building business leaders. See, what I've realized about Ghana's education is you spend 21 years of educating yourself, and then after, you go look for a job, only to find out that there are no vacancies. When you can be a businessman before you even get your degree, why do we keep going out there looking for jobs? Knowing the value of our nation, there is a need to protect it and let us educate our children so whatever we leave for them they can guide it and they can build the future for the ones who are coming I'd like to take you to pillar 8 right now and pillar 8 is environmental and human rights protection well environmental might not sound so serious human rights we don't really care about it but it's very important maybe we should start from the environmental protection do you know that protecting this environment means you're protecting your reserves look at the reserves I've spoken about it look at the trillions look at the amount of jobs that they can create look at the economy look at all of these things so it's our reserves and guess what we are now protecting our reserves. That is our hidden treasures. The reserves is also in the hidden lands, in the, in the waters, the oil, the fishes, the gold, the bauxite, the lithium. It's all in the ground. It's in our water. It's in our farms. So why are we not protecting it? Why is um, maybe an institution like EPA busy chasing me for residual income or chasing the average Ghanaian for a permit that is given already when their main aim is to protect these valuable assets okay I mean you're looking at something like the water poisoning of this country right now it's it's hilarious almost every water body is poisoned and we are talking about a water connection purification and irrigation do you know what it's going to cost us to do that? This water purification to get all our waters back to the way it is. Do you know that this water poisons the land? And this is the land that we grow our crops on. Why do we poison our lands where we grow the food on? Why do we poison the water that we live on, the reserves? Why do we continue to poison the waters that we have our fish from? Why are we poisoning everything? And if it's not us, why do we allow people to do it? Why are we destroying the forests that cleanses the air for us? This policy is for, it's, it's, for us is supposed to be highly valued. 
our national assets, our forestry reserves have billions and trillions of dollars sitting in it. But no one is protecting it. And no one is counting it. And no one has got stock of it. But yet, we're running around. We're sitting on gold by looking for money. Yes. And when you look at all of these things that I've said, you see there is the Forestry Commission, there is the Land Commission, there's all these commissions that can collect commissions. But first, what I think we should do is to build something that would take the records of our lands properly and all national assets on a blockchain platform. This is where the technology hub comes in. So we're going to have a Web3 blockchain development centers that take stock of everything that we have in this country and control. And it goes in their national fund. Industri industrial purification to clean our water bodies, overhaul the EPA, and ensure that it, develop, it delivers the duty effectively. Let's enforce environmental protection laws with no fear or no favor. Environmental protection alone is not enough. We need to protect the rights of our people. The human rights protection. I mean, I, I wanted to show the video of what I saw today with River Pra. I hope that they managed to show it. Yes. So we, we know that we have a problem now. And uh, let's go to the human rights protection. Okay. For me, democracy is only an illusion unless the people's voice can be heard. But why have we disenfranchised millions of young people for so long? Why? Why have we stifled their voices? Let's allow the young people to vote. Let's allow them to have a voice. Let's remember that we've lived more than half of our future, or we have already outlived our future, and let's prepare the grounds for the young people. Let their voice be heard. Let them be a part. Use the appropriate institutions to educate young people about their voting rights. That's democracy. It's their voting rights, their human rights. The voter registration must be open and accessible so long as a citizen turns 18. Let's not take this right from them. And then also, let's protect our journalists by any means possible. This is Freedom Press. Let's ensure that there is press freedom in the country. Encourage the citizens' journalism also to deal with facts, but also protect them so they can speak and their voice can be heard. You know, let's make greater leaps towards aligning Ghana with universal declaration of human rights for the protection of all men, women, and children. This is to allow every single Ghanaian citizen to be valued treated with dignity and respect. I call this equality. Give people fair trials by incentivizing pro bono lawyers for the underprivileged so their cases can be dealt with. We have had lawyers as presidents, but we live under a virtual dictatorship. The end is now. And, and thank you. This brings me to Pillar 8. All right, so at this point, being at Pillar 8, well, I've been talking for a while now. I think I'd like to take a little break, but let me call the moderator. Let me just bring Kafi back on stage. Um, Kafi, I want to use this moment to thank you very much. It's a pleasure, Nana. I know we were supposed to have um, an interview once, and it got cancelled. Mm -hmm. I don't know for whatever reasons, but... It's fine. Now we're together, right? Indeed. God works in mysterious ways. Yes, and I love it. Why are we doing black and white tonight? Well, it's... Uh, What's the code? Well, it's, oh, well, it's black and white. <laughs> black and white. Everything is clear. All right. Yes, indeed. That's it. So, what do you think so far? This is the eighth pillar, but, you know, the ninth pillar is a big thing, so I want to take a little break, but I just wanted to hear from you. Yes, so, well, there's a lot of action virtually, and so people are connecting with the first ever virtual policy launch in mm -hmm. this beautiful Republic of Ghana and keep uh, those interactions coming in. We'll take a quick break, and we want you to keep your eyes focused on two numbers, 10 
and then 276. 10 is for the 10 year plan from the New Force movement, and 276, okay. well, you need to watch. So take a, a look, and we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. down by empty promises and filled leadership but now a new dawn is rising in our beloved country a sweeping change led by the visionary the Nakwami Bidiakum the leader of a new force movement will embark on an unprecedented tour of all 276 constituencies across Ghana he's bringing hope economic freedom and to put power back where it belongs with you be part of this historic revolution that will shape the destiny of our nation Join the New Force Movement now and let's build a nation of our dreams. For too long, Ghanaians have been let down by empty promises and failed leadership. But now, a new dawn is rising in our beloved country. A sweeping change led by the visionary, the Nakwami Bidiakum, the leader of a New Force Movement will embark on an unprecedented tour of all 276 constituencies across Ghana. He's bringing hope, economic freedom, and to put power back where it belongs. With you, be part of this historic revolution that will shape the destiny of our nation. Join the New Force Movement now, and let's build a nation of our dreams. And that's my connection with His Majesty Nitaki. I've been watching you from afar, His Majesty, and Game recognize game and real do too. We didn't drive me in a buy, a frabaco peace, and a frabaco unity. In fee a yabaco, a sassy a yabaco, Nippon so a yabaco, and so so a chum where she ano a yabaco. We are kings, we're queens, we're leaders, and we have to take it because power is not given, power is taken. I stand behind you in any power you take. And I know you'll be behind me too. It is a victory of the Lord that makes a man. Freedom, freedom, to stop freedom. Who are you to stop freedom? Are you God? You can stop freedom. Who are you to stop freedom? Are you God? You can stop freedom. You don't want to tell me, don't kill the tempo. The youth like him. You don't want to tell me, don't kill the tempo.
Today, my plan begins. The 16 regions of Ghana are bustling with untapped riches. Western region boasts of $412 billion in mineral resources. Water region holds $192.6 billion. Eastern region holds $174 billion US dollars. Together, our regions possess trillions in wealth. Ghanaians, this is our divine inheritance. Why should we sell our raw materials for a pittance? Why let others profit while we languish in poverty? This narrative must end now. And the 16th Regional Industrial Revolution is the answer. The 16th Regional Industrial Revolution represents a groundbreaking shift in Ghana's economic paradigm, one that aims to harness the untapped potential of each of Ghana's 16 regions. This ambitious initiative Exactly 97 days to election 2024 in the Republic of Ghana, and you're watching a historic first ever virtual policy launch. Uh, the speaker is Nana Kwame Bediako of the New Force Movement. And before, during the break, uh, somebody was asking me, so when are we going to hear something in any of the Ghanaian languages? Uh, <laughs> did you cover that base? Listen, you know, I'm a very proud Ghanaian, because I can't be anything else but Ghanaian. And when you're Ghanaian, you have to remember this country has a lot of dialects. Out of the 16 regions, we thought of every single region. And there is a transcribed language on every regional industrialization policy. I mean, maybe I should play some for you to see. From Volta to Ashanti to you name it, to Upper West, Upper East... We thought of everyone. Policy is not for me or us. It's for Ghana. It's for the people of this country. And that's why we've had them in thought. And it's theirs. We want them to know the cost, the value, the jobs, everything that that land owns. They're part of it. It's part of the equity. So please, maybe we should play it for, for you to get familiar sure. with it. all right, um, Nana, we're going to continue with Pillar 9. I think it's quite an interesting one. Yeah, so yeah. Take it away. Is. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kafui. It's almost been an hour, 
and some change into the evening since we started this presentation of our developmental agenda and the policy. But now I'm about to get you into Pillar 9, the apostolic governance, the 12 ministries. I mean, apostolic governance, it's, it's a title, it's some title right here, but it's the 12 ministries. They say less is more. Our government will be the leanest, most efficient in the history of African politics. We present to you the apostolic governance, one president, 12 ministers. Create a lean government that will be responsible for the 12 pillars. Now let me start. I'm going to press this, like when you go into one of these, maybe we can press one of them. And um, let's pick one. I'll take you through a few of the ministerial mandates, because I think it's very important that you know what they have to do. So we start with Ministry of Finance. Over the years, there has been a lot of judgment debts, a lot of salary shortage, a lot of paying and paying and paying without returns. We realize that, not to put blames on anyone, that the Ministry of Finance is struggling. So our mandate is to make the Ministry of Finance become an investor and a developer for the nation building. It should be their responsibility. It, they should be accountable for it. You know, we want them to be able to go to the sovereign fund, the IMF, and ask for $10 billion for a project that would be supervised, monitored, controlled by us, our investment going into industrial, going into commercial, going into retail. We should be a part of it and we should control it. And there should be returns. We should not just use our Ministry of Finance for spending. <laughs> we should use our Ministry of Finance for investment. We have to purchase for right purposes that brings returns. The returns that will pay the salary of the workers of this country. And that's how it should circulate, just to stabilize our economy. I can pick maybe trade as well. Well, trade, it's, it's been like a, a, a dormant ministry for me over the past decade. And the mandate for trade is to make Ghana one of the biggest African exporters. The aim of having all of these 16 industrial, uh, 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 regional industrial revolution and having a development in minerals and, and, and agro processing and packaging and food and this and that, is to be able to trade. Now, let's, let's think about uh, AFTA. AFTA is a big project. That's 54 countries of Africa have registered with AFTA. What were they thinking? They don't have the resources. They don't have the product to distribute among these 54 countries. Where was the product going to come from? Were we going to import it? Or somebody else was going to come and put these plants in this country and trade in Africa? Ghana stands to be the flagship, the star, the black star of Africa that will have the power of distribution. They have the waters connected to the coast that can, can just distribute regionally and continentally. And we feed in that gap for after. It's a great opportunity uh, for us. Uh, we should look at Ministry of Agriculture. The mandate for Ministry of Agriculture is to establish the National Seedling Bank. Uh, you know, and an industrial irrigation systems to support it. But we have the National Seedling Bank, like we already said in the reserves. We will have a hundred, a century of food guaranteed for us. And it would be the mandate of Ministry of Agriculture to see to it that this is being monitored, supervised, managed, controlled. And for the public and the citizens of Ghana to get jobs out of this mandate. For the citizens of Ghana to create wealth out of this mandate. But that's what I believe the ministries should be doing. For these 12 apostles should make sure the pillars don't break. Because these pillars is going to hold this nation for the next 500 years 
until greater minds will come together and enhance it again. I mean, we can go through some of the ministries, more of it, and just share the mandate of our policies. But of course, we're going to make sure that uh, there would be the digital copies that it would go to millions of people as well. But the mandate of maybe a Ministry of Interior to secure the right salary and structures and benefits for security service, like police, fire service, prisoners, or prison, uh, prison, prison officers, uh, immigration officers. I mean, if we want to mi minimize corruption, the first thing we need to think about is to give value back to our people. Once they have value, the right salary, there is no way they would like to take pure water for bribe. But, you know, we just need to give value to our people. And we need the Ministry of Interior to have this mandate and take it serious that we're moving from the low-income world that we live to the middle-income world. You know, creating and putting the right structures in place for everybody to get a fair share of salary and build the economy right. Don't forget, taxes will also help the country. The more jobs we create, the more value we bring. And so that's Ministry of Interior. Maybe I should take you through one or two. But I still have three pillars to take you through. So I'm going to take you through this ninth ninth pillar which is the apostolic governance and then take you back to the pillars but there are more and more you have 12 of this we are here to build an army of dedicated Ghanaians who will manage this great nation ladies and gentlemen to lead is to serve and I'm here to serve you thank you now I'm gonna take you out of the apostolic governance and I'm going to take it to one of the biggest pillar surprisingly I guess the title alone Ghana raising Ghana's first 50 billion dollars I mean this is the kind of figures when you call it's like how is Ghana ever going to make this money because we're only struggling over 3 billion and we barely get it how are we going to raise 50 billion? Yes, we are going to raise 50 billion. Says who? Says the young man standing in front of you. This vision and this policy is going to make it happen. If you ever wondered where all this money will come from, well, this is it. And it's very simple. So we decided a collaboration between... Ministry of Foreign Affairs come to services of this country and create a citizenship package to monetize Ghanaian citizenship only in this country, but they will also want to be a part of Ghana's legacy. And so we have to take advantage of that and raise the 50 billion from Africans by Africans. This very policy marks a history today because we will not need the Western world to provide for us anymore now that we know we can raise thousand times more than they give us but remember this is not only about the money the grand agenda in this is introducing African unification is going to start from Ghana we would be the first people to start the project USA United States of Africa by people joining us and we welcome welcoming them through our borders, but also they will be investing on our land. See, we're about to initiate a borderless continent. 
and trade will come through, investment will come through, our neighboring countries will join us. We are about to join hands. We are about to have an entangled economy that cannot be broken anymore, that cannot be separated anymore. See, we have been regionally separated by borders and internally we have been separated by tribes. Once now you have the water connecting, we're coming together by tribes. Once now we have the borderless continent, we're coming together by countries. This is about to end. We are going to import our talents and skills from across Africa. Everywhere. In fact, Niger, I know you're watching me, Nigeria. We are coming for you. I know just you, Nigeria, if I decide that one million of you should invest in my country passport, you will bring the money in five days to Ghana. You would give us 50 billion more. And I promise you, we will trade with you in gold, in oil, and we will make ourselves become successful. Because we are going to raise this capital amongst ourselves. So remember, when I come to power, I will be the first one to invite these Africans to truly become a part of Ghana as African and raise this 50 billion. But guess what? There is a phase two of this money raising. And it's a grand invitation of people of African descendant. History will tell the rest. Now we either move forward together or we stand still separated. And it's one of my favorite pillars. Ten, the tenth pillar. It's just. It's just a great news for us, Ghana. It's just a great news. We found a solution. Now let's go to pillar eleven. Pillar eleven is interesting also, and it's national security and data protection. I mean, we have national security, but. We should remember this. Data is the new blood. And we must secure it. We need the data. That's why we're building the data centers. That's why we're minting. That's why we're building the blockchain and the Web3. The Web3 to store the data and information of this continent. Our aim is to build guns. Ghana's first Web3 platform to support the National Sovereign Wealth Fund. Migrate all national issues have the department to really store our health records, our academic records, our stocks of commodities, and agro reserves on the blockchain network. Our gold reserves, our lab reserves, all the reserves. See, you can see that these pillars are supporting the ministries, and now corruption will be hard for one to commit. Because we're creating wealth, creating jobs amongst ourselves, and we don't need to rob ourselves anymore. But we need to have these platforms to support our stocks and our records. See, we have to make the government transactions, data and information transparent. This system is going to make it impossible to edit. You can't enter again. If we have 10 million ounces of gold, we have 10 million ounces of gold. If it's reserves, no one can change it. <laughs> you can't edit it. We have to make this a national data and information base that is also publicly accessible. That is the free country that we want to live with such an economic freedom. That's what we need. At this point, Transparency and accountability is a necessity. We need it as a country. Now, if the government wants to know you, or the government wants to know about you, then you must know about the government. And that's what this our new Ghana is going to do for us. Transparency. See, 
bring real account account and response of we're coming close to the end of this presentation and pillar 12 is a pillar at the cornerstone of this country that a lot of people cannot see the value of it and we did not invest in it right so we're now becoming victims to the international world for those who have trained us and made us better and that's sports and the creative industry well i know that ghana has breeded a lot of stars musicians footballers but how many of them you can probably count them our approach to the sports and creative industry is ownership and control we need this we need ownership and control we have to own the academies own the music catalogs and own the distribution power how are we going to do this let's start by the sports i mean first of all everybody watches football from outside every day and they, they, they actually depend on it but hey we can invest in the sports sector basketball long tennis and boxing and etc well this is our plan first we're going to build 16 multifunctional sports academies in all the regions because we don't know where ronaldo is we don't know where messi is you can find them in any of the region and therefore we're not going to discriminate we make sure that there are academies to search for these talents everywhere in ghana and we're going to nurture them grow them own them and they also have to own us now what happens when we build this multifunctional sports academies you see it attracts something it attracts educational investors where they come to yourself to the academies and and your child might be in the academy but there is an education to support them so they just don't become a footballer without not or they just don't end up with their knowledge in their foot they have to also learn about their country and their resources and what they can create it will also um obviously apart from the educational facilities i believe that there could be other things that they will attract in every region to discover more talent but the point is we're trying to breed athletes world-class stars because they contribute to our economy one artist can bring billions home in value through endorsement and many things but we have to start nurturing them now we have to start building all these platforms and bringing them out from ghana and even finding more beyond our borders we have to also think about how we're going to offer this scholarships this exchange programs through partnerships and partner schools with talented students and then work with them so that's for me with sports although i don't spend too much time for sports uh i know that it, it it has a future in ghana especially but let's go to entertainment entertainment for me is very interesting you know we have the likes of some of the greatest artists coming from this country you know and, and we go way back from ocbs when they made it to the international platform but we couldn't protect or secure the royalties because we didn't even build the machine today the new falls have decided to build the right machine for for pushing the publishing act that protects the ip of our content creators i mean you're talking from bloggers to influencers to youtubers authors painters musicians uh music softwares and filmmakers and software licenses all of this we have to protect it we have to claim the royalties and we have to make sure that it's circulating in our economy because they're part of us you know to allow artists to hold on to their catalogs such that they're not sold for patents that's one two we need to build a world-class studio ghana is the black star of africa this studio needs to be in ghana we need to build that studio that hollywood type studio that tyler perry studio type and that is going to attract the market from other countries it's going to boost tourism it's going to bring people from south africa nigeria england europe america to come here and make their movies and do their production and of course we need to entrust the national security 
to partner or collaborate with the NCA and the Cyber Security Department to clamp down the piracy completely. That's the biggest corruption in this area. And I know the likes of all the musicians in this country right now, artists and everybody, you need this. I need it for you too. We need to clamp it down so we can get our real residual income. Our real royalties will come to us without people intersecting or interjecting the funds before it reaches us. Once we secure our publishing terrain, it will elevate our creative industry to deal with international entertainment corporations such as the Sony, the Universal, the Columbia. You know, we, we need to partner with them the iTunes to distribute songs, all the international giants. And talking about creative industry, we can't talk about creative industry without talking about fashion and arts. Now, fashion is important. The way you dress is the way you are dressed. But hey, we have to create a world-class art gallery for the African art and culture. And this comes together. It comes together with the people. You know, you have to mix, mix the two. Create the pattern, the plants, and the production. When I say pattern, I mean you have to understand what fashion is when you go from couton to textile to um, yard and to the pattern before you bring the shirt or the clothes. And then you have to be able to have industrial power to do more production, excessive production and distribute. This is where I think what our fashion industry need to go. You know, having power of production and power of distribution by using the cotton right and get the shirts out this final pillar shall be managed monitored and evaluated by the ministry of tourism i'm now bringing you to the end of my presentation and i stand for three different things so is the new force it's equity equality and empowerment Every individual deserves the opportunity to thrive, regardless of their background, gender, or circumstance. We are here to foster a society where every voice, from different abled to be to the underprivileged, everybody has to be heard. Where every talent is nurtured, and every dream has to have a chance to become a reality. This is our commitment, the new force, yes. to create a new Ghana right. where okay. equity, equality, and empowerment are the norms. Paving the way for a country that is forward, that is inclusive, just and truly a transformation. Let us move. Let us move forward together. And with this vision, united in our re resolve to build a brighter future, a more equitable future for all, for one Ghana, one people, and one nation. Thank you very much for tonight. I would like to um, bring Kafui back. Um, maybe I, I need to talk about the 10-year plan, which is the seven the non-negotiables. The seven non-negotiables. And... Um, how have you been all night? Well, I should be asking you, uh, first of all, that's a masterful job. That Thank you. Thank you very much. Two hours on your feet explaining your vision to the people of Ghana. And there's a lot of uh, reaction and feedback across the portals. So I'm sure there's going to be a lot of plugging into to find out exactly what your, your vision is. And I want to say thank you for giving the people the opportunity to hear what is in your mind for thank the people you. of Ghana. Thank you. And that wraps up our very historic first ever virtual policy launch by Nana Kwame Pediaku. Um, from the New Force Movement. Keep it uh, going. My name is Kafui Day, and have a good evening. It's 97 days to election 2024. God bless. Well, thank you very much once again, Ghana. I really appreciate you for this moment, and I would like to leave you with my 10-year vision, the seven non-negotiable principles that will build this country and beyond Ghana borders. Enjoy the vision, and I'm here to serve you.